friends, and welcome to Sleepy Time Tales, the podcast aimed at helping you to get a good night's sleep. Do you find your mind plagued with the stresses of modern life, especially when the lights are out and you're trying to get a restful night? Does your spinning mind keep you awake? Follow my voice down the path towards a good night's rest. Listen to me tell a story that will keep your mind from wandering to your daytime problems. The ones that you can't solve right now and will be easier to solve while rested. Listen to my voice and allow yourself to drift, following the twists and turns of the story, but slowly letting go and drifting into sleep. Hey, note for new listeners. If this is your first time joining us, part of the plan with the show is this long intro which usually goes on for roughly 15 minutes. If you want to get straight to the story, there is a timestamp in the show description that will get you straight there. But aside from the couple of minutes of promotion I'm about to go into, the intro does serve a purpose which I will explain in a few minutes. So I do recommend you stick around, especially if it's your first couple of, couple of nights with us. Now most podcasts put their promotion and cup rattling halfway through or even at the end. But because I'm hoping you're asleep long before we get there, I need to put this stuff up front. If you don't want to listen to it, there is a timestamp in the show notes for the main story, and I absolutely do not take it personally if you skip to that. Now, I would like to introduce our sponsor for this episode. Someone who has been listening to the show for a while would know that mental health is something that I talk about quite often. Because insomnia is often a cause and consequence of mental health issues, particularly anxiety and things like that. Now I've got a minor issue with anxiety. I don't really like to talk about it too much. Because in the greater scheme of things, it's pretty minor. But if you suffer anxiety or any other issues and you feel like you need someone to talk to, try out BetterHelp. That's H-E-L-P. Better help will assess your needs and match you with your own licensed professional therapist. You can start communicating within 24 hours of signing up. It is not a crisis line. It is not self-help. This is professional counseling done securely online. There is a broad range of expertise in Better Help's counselor network. Often these particular experts may not be locally available in your area. The service is available to clients worldwide and you can log into your account any time and send a message to your counsellor. You'll get timely and thoughtful responses, plus you can schedule weekly video or phone sessions, so you won't ever have to sit in a waiting room as with traditional therapy. People often struggle to find a counsellor who they really can connect with, so BetterHelp makes this easier by making it easy and free to change counsellors if needed. It is more affordable than traditional online counselling and financial aid is available. Better help wants you to start living a better life today. Visit trybetterhelp.com slash sleepy time. That's trybetterhelp.com slash sleepy time. And join the over 500,000 people taking charge of their mental health. Hmm, taking charge of their mental health. With the help of an experienced professional. There's a special offer for Sleepy Time Tales listeners. You get 10% off your first month off. If you use that link that I provided, which is trybetterhelp.com slash sleepy time, and that's also going to be in the show notes. And if you, other than that, if signing up uh, with therapy seems like a step too far, and you are finding that the uh, show helps you to get a good night's sleep, whether it's weekly, nightly, or however often you listen, and you would like to help me keep the show running and available for free, I'd like you to consider signing up at patreon.com slash sleepytimetales. Also linked in the show notes to support the work that I do. And um, help Sleepy Time Tales to continue help yourself, to continue to help yourself and others. There are bonuses available for supporters on the Patreon, so take a look at the support levels and bonuses that are available So you get something even more than the satisfaction of helping keep the show going and helping it to reach more people. There are shout outs available, bonus episodes and special edits of standard episodes. Lately as well, um, doing the main episode gets released early for supporters of $2 and $5 levels 
And anyone who signs up at a $5 level will receive a fun touristy postcard from Durban, South Africa in the mail. So if you're interested in listening to weekly bonus episodes or special edits of standard episodes, just take a look. But there's another big way you can help to spread the word. If there's someone in your life who you think will benefit from listening to Sleepy Time Tales, just let them know. If you recommend the show on social media, make sure to tag me in so that I know and can thank you. It's at Sleepy Time Tales on Instagram or Twitter. Speaking of social media, I got a very nice uh, recommendation actually in the end of February and I've been really slack about uh, giving it the shout out. So I just want to say hi to Morgan Smith, who did a, made a recommendation in the, on the 26th of February, who said, uh, this puts me to sleep every time when nothing else does. So grateful to find these podcasts. Um, thank you very much. I don't often ask for reviews from people, and I always appreciate them when they come. And I think the Facebook recommendations really help because that gets, gets it in front of people who may, may actually need the help rather than um, uh, general other reviews on like iTunes and stuff. So uh, thanks again, Morgan, for the, shout, for the uh, kind words, and I'm glad we're here to help you. Last but not least that I'm going to go into tonight is I'm going to give shout out the music. I think it's a very important part of the identity of the show, and that is um, something uh, worth shouting out. So uh, the song is Un Désert by the artist Kumiko. I uh, found their music on the Free Music Archive, and I've linked their website in the show notes. Which, because they've got some very cool stuff released under various names, so I recommend that you check it out. So thank you for taking the time, and uh, let's get back to the show. So what exactly is Sleepy Time Tales? What is it for? It's a bit of a strange idea, isn't it? A podcast that you're supposed to fall asleep to. But in this 21st century, especially this year of 2020, lack of sleep is something of a public health crisis. And this is a podcast that is intended to help those that it can to get a restful night. Do you find yourself lying awake at night with your mind spinning and emotions in turmoil with anxieties of 21st century life? Do you wake up in the middle of the night and find yourself not quite able to doze back off at 3am? I'm here to help. My name is Dave and I'm your narrator, here to help you into a restful night. Now I've struggled to sleep basically ever since I was a baby. I gave my parents sleepless nights for many years, and even once I got old enough not to bother them anymore, I, was, I always struggled to sleep. I went through my teens and twenties and early thirties before I eventually discovered that droning voices, particularly male ones, have a tendency to sedate me like I've been tranquilized. I used to find myself falling asleep at night listening to the podcast that I was trying to actually listen to, and then I suddenly would uh, find myself waking up when they were over. And uh, I started actually listening to some of those podcasts, particularly back episodes, specifically for the purpose of falling asleep to. And then one day I discovered that there are podcasts out there that are designed and intended for people to have a good night's sleep. I tried out a couple that worked quite well for me, but when I recommended them to other people, they often didn't quite go for it. They either didn't really understand what the purpose was, or quite a few people didn't like the voices of the specific narrators that are recommended. So I thought to myself, I've got a boring, deep, droney voice, so let me see if I can step into a gap that uh, might be able to help some other people who haven't been able to get reached. And here I am, doing my small part. Now... Every episode starts out with this long intro, which usually runs for about 15 minutes, more or less. It's one of those things not everybody really enjoys. It's the thing that I've actually gotten probably the most negative comments about. But it's been a while since I've heard anything uh, negative about it. Because it's here for a reason. It's here for two reasons. The first one is, for people who are not familiar with sleep podcasts and don't, maybe don't necessarily know what they're for, 
I need to ex explain it and sort of make a case for it and explain to people how I think it's best to engage with it. And once you've been around for a while and you've been listening to the, the show for a few days or weeks or even months, it's the intro becomes part of the process, part of the almost ritual for people to engage with the show. Because what we're trying to do here is we're trying to build a space together, trying to create new habits and um, sort of um, repeated behaviors and repeated rituals thing are things that help. Now, as far as I know, there's a couple of different ways to engage with the show. For me, when I listen to sleep podcasts, I need something to focus on, something specific, a story or an event that lets me keep my mind on, on a point, on, a, on something to stop it spinning out because I have a tendency towards stress and anxiety when I'm trying to sleep. I'm one of those that uh, lies in the dark and stares at the ceiling thinking about everything that could possibly go wrong. And uh, so I need something to distract me from that, something to just focus on just enough not to resist sleep when it comes for me. There's a second way that I think some people engage with the show and that's something a little bit more... A little bit more primal, as I think I would, I would explain it. A lot of people just need some kind of white noise or some kind of background. A literal white noise or pink noise or the sound of the ocean or rain or maybe just some boring dude droning on in the background. The main thing is, what the, the actual topic of the show, the actual story is of secondary relevance. I put some effort into making sure it's something interesting for those who don't fall asleep. But really, ultimately, you're supposed to be falling asleep. Tonight's story to fall asleep to is actually something a little bit unusual for me. I'm doing something completely non-fictional, or not, not even a memoir. I've done non-fictions before, but they're usually memoirs, sort of autobiographical type things. Tonight's, though, is a how-to manual on how to bring up, bring up turkeys. It was uh, something I just randomly came across and I scanned through it a bit and I was like, I think this is going to work very well to help people fall asleep. In fact, about uh, 15 minutes into recording tonight's story, I really regretted the decision because I was struggling to stay awake while I was recording it. And uh, the edit was uh, quite, quite trying because uh, it is quite repetitive. If you think I'm losing it and repeating myself, it's actually the manual itself that's repeating itself quite a lot. So that's not all on me, just to be clear. And um, yeah, it's just, unless you're really fascinated by the ins and outs of breeding turkeys in Massachusetts and New England, it's monumentally boring. And uh, I think this is going to help people sleep quite well. But whether you're fascinated by turkeys or completely bored by them, it doesn't really matter. What you need to do is don't force it. As I go on about uh, the various. Um, products and methods for looking after turkeys and cold weather don't try for sleep just allow just keep a light mental grip on what i'm telling you and allow sleep to come for you now obviously if all goes well i'm hoping that you're asleep before i get to the end of the episode but it's important you don't feel pressurized it may not work on the first night it may take a few nights for you to get used to listening to my voice. Maybe my accent is strange to you. Maybe one episode just isn't long enough. But it is very important that whatever you do, you try to relax. If you're new to the show and prone to late nights lying staring at the ceiling, this may take some time. It may take a couple of days to work for you. I recommend that if this is the first time discovering Sleepy Time Tales, you give it at least two or three nights. If by the third night it's not working for you, then maybe I'm not for you and there's options out there. There's some really fantastic sleep costs that I'm sure you'll find. Um, highlights for me are Sleep With Me and uh, Boring Books for Bedtime. Those are my favorites as well as Nothing Much Happens. Different voice types, different story types, uh, all of us doing what we can to help people in our own way. But yeah. Give it at least two or three nights of this of this show just to just to see if it if it works for you eventually. Um, 
And also it's possible that one episode isn't long enough, especially if it's new for you. Queue up a few episodes or run through the backlog. What I do with Musty Podcasts is I have about 10 of each one downloaded already and I start with the latest and then just let them run all night. Because often, lately especially, I, I don't actually have so much trouble falling asleep. For me, what happens is I wake up at like 3 o'clock in the morning and I can't get back to sleep. So I've got my podcast running and I just, if my earbuds have fallen out, I pop them back in and I go back to sleep. Something that happens quite a lot is I sometimes wake up 30 minutes before my alarm. I usually just carry on listening and sometimes again I manage to fall asleep again. and. It may sound utterly pointless. Why, why would I bother even bother to try to go to sleep 30 minutes before the alarm? But I recommend you try it. There's something about that getting that last 30 minutes right before the alarm that is just deeply satisfying. And so you have the basic idea. You relax and you lie in the dark, and while you do that, I tell you a tale. So relax, dear listener. My nighttime friend who's elected to lie in the dark, listening to my voice. You will always be safe with me. I'm here to help you relax, to improve your life in a small way, or maybe not so small. People don't sleep very well these days and it makes their lives harder. So I'm here to do my small part to help you in a big way, to help you to face tomorrow and the day after well-rested and better able to cope and process. I believe very strongly in the benefits of kindness. I want to be kind to you. I want to share kindness with you. And it's pointless if you can't be kind to yourself. Many of us insomniacs have had those nights where we lie awake and beat ourselves, uh, beat ourselves up and rebuke ourselves over not being able to get to sleep. But that doesn't help. Don't get tense if you just can't get yourself over the edge of sleep, even with me here in your ears trying to help. Frustration is one of the great enemies of a good night's sleep. The intention with this podcast is to short-circuit that frustration, to distract the feeling we get when we blame ourselves for not being able to let go and drift into the dark. So take a breath. Forgive the fact that you can't sleep and just let my voice wash over you. Take another breath. Imagine the warm darkness rising up, inviting you to a better life starting tomorrow. And if you just can't let go, forgive yourself and we'll try again tomorrow. If you've had a life of insomnia, sleep is something like an enemy. But it is not your enemy. It's a natural process that we've been pulled away from by stress and life and progress. I'm here to work with you, to create a safe space, a cocoon in which you can curl up and allow nature to take its course. So if you're still with me, thank you for staying. If you're already asleep, we'll chat again soon. And of course, you aren't hearing me, except maybe in a dream. Margaret Mahaney talks about turkeys. The skillful New England razor tells us some of the secrets of the successful raising of turkeys. Introduction by Philip R. Park More than a century and a quarter ago, there was fired in Concord, Massachusetts, a shot that was heard around the world. This shot terminated the domination of a monopoly and marked the opening of a new era the building of a new empire. Not less important to all lovers of turkeys is the shot fired in the same beautiful old town by Margaret Mahaney when she first put an end to the bogey that had been hovering over the turkey industry for so long, i.e. Blackhead. Not less triumphant has been her conquest of practically all the ailments besetting this beautiful bird. It is really beyond belief that Miss Mahaney has raised in a season 300 turkeys with a loss of less than 2%, 
when for years the experiment stations and agricultural colleges, as well as nearly all poultrymen, have claimed that turkeys could not be raised in this state. All would recognize this as wonderful work if applied to chickens, but when accomplished with turkeys it is doubly wonderful. These same experiment station directors had told Miss Mahaney that she could not do the things she was already accomplishing, but when they visited her farm they held up their hands and departed, acknowledging that here was a woman who had performed the miracle. Miss Mahaney was a wonderfully capable trained nurse who broke down at her work and was ordered out to the country to save her life, urged particularly to take up some out-of-door work. Poultry keeping appealed to her from the first, but turkeys particularly for the reason of the difficulties to be surmounted. If she could do what others could not, she would be satisfied. Anyone could raise chickens, but hardly anyone could raise turkeys. Here was a task that delighted her and a problem that appealed to her. The difficulties she encountered would have discouraged anyone but a pioneer of her character. Her deep maternal instinct, and she is, figuratively speaking, mother to everything and everybody upon the beautiful estate where she lives, brought the babies and old turkeys through their blackhead troubles, and from her medical training, together with the aid she received from contact with members of her family who were physicians, she recognized symptoms and remedies which one could acknowledge as miracles and not overstep the truth. She has applied the fruits of her life work to the solving of a problem and some day the country at large from Maine to California will raise its hat to Margaret Mahaney, the lady from Concord, Massachusetts, who restored what's supposed to be lost, the art of raising turkeys. And that in confinement in poultry houses under practically the same conditions as chickens, if you find time to go to Concord, by all means call on Miss Mahaney, and she will make you welcome. She will show you more turkeys than have ever before been raised in one flock in the eastern states, and she will delight in telling you the simple methods she uses. On the following pages, she will tell you in her own way how she accomplishes it. We repeat, Miss Mahaney is a wonderful woman. She has a beautiful estate on which to produce these birds but others are doing just as wonderful work with them by following her teachings. A letter to my readers. Turkey Park, Concord, Massachusetts. My dear readers, the following is a copy of a letter recently received by me, and which represents the type of communications I have received daily for over three years from all parts of the country. My dear Miss Mahaney, Although we are strangers to each other, I am writing you today regarding turkey raising. I read some time ago in the Boston Post that you had good success in raising turkeys, so I take the liberty of writing you for instructions, if you will kindly give them to me. I have tried for several years to raise a few, but it has been a hard job. They would do well for about six or seven weeks, then grow sick with liver and bowel trouble and fade away. Now what is the trouble? What must they be fed with? Must the range or be kept in a yard? In fact, what way must I manage to raise turkeys? What is your experience? Please write me, sincerely. It is in answer to such letters as the foregoing that I am placing my methods in book form on the market in order to enlighten the breeders of turkeys and to inform them how I first succeeded where others have failed. In the first place I visited two or three farms in the country. I found that no care whatever was taken of the turkeys. A common hen was fairly well looked after, fed and kept warm. The turkey was supposed to forage for itself, roost on old wagons or any sort of roost that the bird found convenient at night and in all kinds of weather. Conditions were anything but sanitary. Inbreeding was permitted year after year as one tom was thought sufficient for the hen turkeys of five or six neighbours. I visited one farm in particular which had on it turkeys from very nice stock, about 20 in all. Of course they were small and pale and had not developed as they should have. They roosted in a sort of shed right off the barn cellar so that they had access to the barn cellar and they roamed around on the manure pile all day. The manure was turned down through an opening under the cows. The roof of that shed had no shingles on it and in wet weather the rain simply poured down on those birds. It is only natural that conditions such as these will bring on roop and all kinds of diseases. 
the birds will not be developed and cannot possibly be strong enough when the spring comes to fulfill the duties of the breeding season. Birds hatched amid such surroundings are tainted with roop and other afflictions. It is not very long ago since I had a talk with a gentleman from Vermont. He told me that at one time Vermont made a large amount of money in turkey raising. When the turkeys got to be four or five weeks old, the raisers simply turned them out and let them take care of themselves. Those that lived through the summer, weathered storms and all other kinds of hardship, they rounded up in the fall, fattened for market, or sold for breeders. This was what they called clear profit. Everyone can readily understand to what that clear profit has led. The result is that our splendid bronze turkeys are dying out by the thousands each year. And within seven or eight more years, if something is not done to strengthen the turkey and keep it up to the standard of at least the common hen, our famous turkey of America will be a thing of the past. Whereas if the turkey, when hatched, is given good feed, as described in another part of my book, taken care of until the red is thrown, and then turned into a good warm shed at night, kept dry and warm in damp weather, and fed reasonably, three-thirds of the trouble in raising turkeys can be avoided. Care must be given to the breeding hens. They must be kept in sanitary quarters, given plenty of good feed, with four drops of tincture of iron to a gallon of water, plenty of lime and sand, about half and half, and left where they can eat it at their own convenience. If you give ground bone, have it very fine, for it is apt to lodge in the corner of the mouth and sometimes will cause ulceration. When this happens, the jowl of the bird will become swollen and on close examination, there will be found a small piece of white bone which will have to be removed, and the mouth washed with sulfonaphthal or presto disinfectant. I generally use my salve two or three times before the wound is healed. If the bird that lays the eggs is good and strong, the turkeys that are hatched will be strong and rugged and to keep them growing from the start has always been my motto. In my closing paragraph, I wish to say to all my readers that I have been the most sincere and straightforward in everything that I've written in this book. To one and all who may read this, I extend a cordial invitation to visit my turkey farm in Concord, Massachusetts, that you may see for yourselves the progress I have made in the last eight years in raising turkeys in yards under the same conditions as chickens a feat which has been claimed heretofore by experiment stations to be impossible to accomplish in poultry congested New England. I have laboured with the problem of turkey raising for many years and sincerely believe myself to be in a position to advise others who may be beginners, as I once was, concerning the difficulties of turkey raising and the best method of overcoming them. I remain sincerely yours, Margaret Mahaney. March 19th, 1913. Facts about turkey raising. The one great essential on the part of a person raising or attempting to raise turkeys is patience or persistency, whichever you care to call it. To avoid thinking of starting in this work, I can only say that you will meet with plenty of difficulties and much that will discourage and dishearten you. But when you remember that each failure or discouragement means just that you have much more added to your knowledge of and experience in this work, it should give you heart to keep on. And if you do keep on and on, using each little bit of experience thus gained and using it to good effect, in the end success is bound to come. I'm going to tell you a few of the discouraging things that happened to me, and also of my method of raising turkeys, a method based on long experience and perfected in the face of many discouragements. I hope that in the telling you may learn something that will be of benefit. I started with 12 turkey eggs. Had I known then how hard they are to raise, I wonder if I would have attempted it. I hatched out 8 turkeys from that lot of eggs and I raised just one. I named her Hen Hen as she is on my place today and is at the head of all my flock. The following year I hatched out over 30 turkeys and only succeeded in raising four. My work was then carried on lowland. The next year I put old Hen Hen on higher ground where I'm raising all my flock today. She hatched out 15 turkeys and I raised all but one. I killed off some of the young toms and kept all the pullets, all of which I still have, and they are splendid, strong stock, short-legged, heavy and a splendid bronze. 
I then sent to Kentucky and brought out some of the best stock I could find down there, and then began my battle to raise turkeys. I had very good success, that is, as far as I went. At first I knew hardly anything about the proper way to feed, and the right food to give my turkeys, but as the years went by my experience in feeding taught me a great deal. Breeding now, I will tell you in as concise a way as possible the method I consider proper in raising turkeys. In the first place, it is necessary to have a good strong two-year-old hen to breed with from a tom that is no relation whatever to the family. One of the foremost things you must be particular not to do is inbreed. I much prefer a common hen to put my first batch of eggs under. That will give the turkey hens a much longer time to lay. I consider it better to put my turkey hens on my June eggs. I put 15 eggs under a turkey hen and 11 under a common hen. When the little turkeys come out, I disinfect their heads and under the wings with my own salve. Have you ever seen a little turkey that has a cold in its head wipe its beak under its wing? I have many times found the feathers under the wings matted as a result of this ill-bred habit of theirs. That, of course, is not a healthy state for a young bird that is growing. And that is the reason that I disinfect with my solve under their wings and on their heads, and they always seem brighter afterwards. I have good strong runs, 5 feet long and 4 feet wide, with high coops and thorough ventilation from the top, which carries off all the impure and overheated air, and keeps the temperature normal at the bottom of the coops for the little turkeys. On hot days I cover my runs with burlap. The turkeys must be kept clean and dry, and their straw must be well aired every day. Once a week I wash out the bottom of the coop with disinfectant and put in clean straw. I give them all the lettuce they can eat three times daily, as the secret of raising turkeys is to keep the bowels in good order and the droppings are bright green. Just as soon as I see a little turkey with its wings drooping, I take it away from the others and treat it as described on page 82. I have invented my own pills for the cure of blackhead, and they are now being largely used by turkey raisers all through New England. When my little turkeys are about three or four days old, I give them Margaret Mahaney's turkey feed and a little skim milk with a good solid feed of lettuce, all they can eat. At noon I feed them lettuce again in clean water containing tincture of iron, four drops to each gallon of water. At night I feed them bread soaked in milk and lettuce cut up fine with an onion and a shake of red pepper. After having dry feed all day, they relish the soft feed at night. There is no reason why, if you use my method in raising turkeys and have your runs on high ground, you cannot be successful. If the turkeys are raised in the right way and they are no harder to raise than chickens. When the pullets are about four months old, they should be given Epsom salts twice a week a small teaspoonful to a gallon of water. This keeps the turkey in good condition and the blood cool. Also, a tablespoonful of sulfate of iron in a pail of water should be left in some place where they can drink it. Keep them good and dry until they are ready for shipment, for turkeys are subject to blackhead until they are one year old. I will be only too glad to give any information in my power to people who are interested in the subject. While the experimental colleges have put out some bulletins on the care of turkeys, the person that is going to issue a report on the raising of turkeys must go out in the field and be with them from the time they are baby chicks until they are ready to be disposed of, and then it will be many years before he will know all there is to know about turkey raising. I have spent years on my turkeys and I think that I am now in a position to give any information that any grower may require in regards to this matter. A brief outline of my method of raising turkeys. In the first place, I select a good, quiet hen that has been sitting two or three days and put her in a deep, warm nest not too far from the top of the box so that when she goes to feed, the hen will not break the eggs by jumping on them when she returns to the nest. Twelve eggs seems a great number of turkey eggs to put under one hen, but that is what I put under every common hen and I sometimes hatch out all the eggs. I spray the nests well with sulphur and also use my salve on the hen up till the 16th day. 
I never put any disinfectant on the hen or on her nest after that, because there is life inside the eggs by that time and the disinfectant is very apt to kill it. When the eggs begin to hatch, and some will hatch out before the rest, these I take away, placing them in a good warm box wrapped in flannel, and keep them good and warm until all the eggs are hatched out, and the mother able to receive them. When the eggs begin to hatch, some will hatch out before the rest. These I take away, placing them in a good warm box wrapped in flannel, and keep them good and warm until all the eggs are hatched out, and the mother able to receive them. When they are two days old, I put the young turkeys in a good clean coop, well whitewashed and waterproof. My runs are five feet long and four feet wide. I shut my little birds up in the coop for the first four days until they become good and strong. After that, if the weather is fine and warm, I let them out about ten o'clock and put them in about three o'clock. Their first food consists of a hard-boiled egg, a shake of red pepper, and three parts of dandelion, cut up fine. You can give them all the green food they will eat and also powdered charcoal and fine grit. After they are three or four days old, I give them bread and milk squeezed dry and the Margaret Mahaney turkey feed. The young poults are kept in runs, which should be moved to a new spot each day, and care taken that they are kept clean, dry and warm. And the straw must be taken out of the coops and thoroughly aired and kept good and clean, as the sanitary condition is half the battle in raising turkeys. Place your runs on a side hill facing the south. On hot days, cover the runs with burlap. Let them out into the runs for two hours or more every afternoon that is pleasant and dry, until the time the birds are nine weeks old. Do not let them out in damp weather before they are two years old, for they are very susceptible to dampness and should be kept housed and warm in rainy and damp weather. While the little birds are out, watch carefully for hawks and pests. Give the turkeys all the milk you can afford to give, as this will keep them growing. Plant a good field of lettuce and give them all this vegetable they can eat, and you will find they will eat lettuce three times a day with good relish. One of the secrets of raising turkeys is to keep the droppings a bright green. That of course keeps the liver in good condition and goes a long way in keeping blackhead out of the flock. Take some slime, slack it, put half sand with it, and make a sort of soft mush out of it. Place this on a board and dry it, then crumble it up and leave it around where your little turkeys can get it to eat. Keep them in dry, tight houses with the south side open so that they may have an abundance of fresh air without drafts. When it is time to let them out of the runs, you can let them out for three and four hours at a time. You will find that they will want to go back to the runs when they become tired. Do not give them much feed at night, give them plenty of time to digest everything in their bowels and they will be ready for a good morning meal. Throwing the Red When they show signs of throwing the red, put four drops of tincture of iron to a gallon of drinking water three or four times a week. If it is cold rainy weather, put a drop of aconite in the water every day while the wetter weather lasts. This will prevent their taking cold, and as cold as the first sign of blackhead and diarrhea, it can be easily seen that a little precaution is worth more than a pound of cure. In regard to keeping lice off the little turkeys, you must disinfect your hens and the turkeys very frequently. My soul for that purpose is a convenient and effective remedy. If you will do as I have instructed you in the above paragraphs, I do not think you will have much trouble in raising turkeys. Keep them dry by all means until they are five months old. Breeding Selection and Treatment of Breeding Stock There are some rules that must be followed in the selection of turkeys for breeding if it is hoped to succeed. Careless indifference has given no end of trouble to turkey raisers. In some instances, which the writer has investigated, all the turkeys owned in one locality have descended from one original bird purchased many years before. In one case it was said that for 20 years no new blood had come into the neighbourhood. If this foolish procedure had been continued, it would have resulted in the destruction of the constitutional vigour of the turkeys. Rules for the selection of stock A few plain rules which may be observed to advantage are as follows. 
Always use as breeders turkey hens over one year old. Be sure that they are strong, healthy and vigorous of good medium size. In no instance select the smaller ones, but do not strive to have them unusually large. The male may be a yearling or older. Do not imagine that the large overgrown males are the best. Strength, health and vigor with a well-proportioned medium size are the main points of excellence. Avoid a close breeding. New blood is of vital importance to the turkeys. Better send a thousand miles for a new male than risk the chance of inbreeding. Secure one in the fall so as to be assured of his healthy and vigorous constitution prior to the breeding season. Kind of hens to select. No matter what variety of turkey may be selected for keeping, they should, above all things, be strong, vigorous, healthy and well matured, but not akin. Better secure the females from one locality and the male from another to ensure their non-relationship, rather than run the risk of inbreeding. In all fowls, it is well to remember that size is influenced largely by the female and colour and finish by the male. Securing an over-large male to mate with small weekly hens is not wise policy. A medium-sized male with a good-sized female of good constitutional vigour and mature age will do far better than the largest male bird with the smallest females. The wise farmer always selects the very best corn or grain of all kinds for seeds. Equal care should be given the selection of the breeding stock in turkeys. The best raised on the farm should be reserved for producers and the fact should be kept in mind that turkey hens of the best quality after their second and third year make the best producers. Keep your best young hens with this in view. Undersized hens that lack constitutional vigor are not the kinds to select for successful turkey breeding. When you stop to consider that the male turkey is half of the entire flock in the matter of breeding, we may be led to greater care in the selection. None can be too good for the purpose. Constitutional vigor is of the first importance. Without this, he can have no value whatever for the purpose intended. Plenty of bone, a full round breast and log body are important. No matter what stock or breeding the hen may be, the male should be selected from one of the standard varieties. If the hens of the same standard variety, the male of the same variety should be selected, so as to maintain the stock in its purity. Well-selected individuals of some one of the several standard species will give better results than can be secured by crossbreeding, which has a tendency to bring to the surface the weak points of both sides of the cross. Proper crosses may improve the first issue, but if followed up, they rarely prove successful. Number of females to one male. The best rule for mating is to confine in yards, using eight or nine females to one male. Some say 12, but all I ever mate to one tom is eight females. The result of this number is that all my eggs prove fertile. When they are yarded and from eight to 10 females are kept, it is better to have two toms and keep one shut up while the other is with the hens, changing them at least twice a week. When they run at large on a farm, they will naturally divide into flocks. Under such conditions, use one male to no more than six females. Care to be given to breeding stock. March and April are the two months of the year that the breeding hen should have particular care. In the first place, I keep them warm and comfortable with a box of sand where they can dust themselves every day. There is no bird that takes such pleasure in dusting herself as the turkey. She will roll in the sand for hours at a time in the sun, and this makes her happy and contented. At this time, I feed plenty of Margaret Mahaney's turkey feed with oyster shells, always within reach, and a mixture of wheat, oats, barley, a very little cracked corn, and beef scraps fed three or four times a week. Give plenty of drinking water, and three or four times a week, put a drop or two of tincture of iron to a gallon of drinking water. This keeps the birds healthy and strong. Take half lime and half sand, make a mush of it, and spread it on a board to dry. When it is hard, place it in a box and leave it where your turkey hen can get it to eat at her own convenience. That helps mature the eggs. She is very tender at this time. All through the laying season, she must be kept warm and comfortable. It all goes towards making a successful season of turkey raising. March is the proper time to mate up your pens of turkeys. I put one tom in a pen with eight hens. 
I watch my turkey hens very closely to see that they are not injured in any way by the spurs of the tom. If the turkey hen goes around with one wing down, you will know that she has been hurt, and if you take her up, you will probably find that her side has been torn by a tom. Wash her carefully with a disinfectant, and if the wound needs a stitch, it had better be taken as it will heal quicker. Feeding during breeding season In February and March, do not feed your turkey hens too rich food, or too many beef scraps, or food of any kind that will force the hens to lay too early. You do not want any young chicks hatched out before the 1st of May or the last of April. When my turkey hens start to lay, I feed a ground feed that is put up under my formula by the Park and Pollard Company of Boston, Massachusetts, which they are putting out under the name of Margaret Mahaney's Turkey Feed, and which can be procured of all of them ready for feeding. Have plenty of beef scraps and oyster shells within easy reach. Twice a week, put tincture of iron in the drinking water, four drops to a gallon of water, allow one gallon of water to each pen. The tincture of iron keeps the bird strong and in good condition, as a young turkey hen is very apt to weaken after a first litter of eggs is laid. Sometimes they die if not properly cared for. Keep on hand within easy reach constantly a mixture of half sand and half lime made into a soft mush. When dry, crumble up and leave it where your turkeys can get it to eat. They will eat this ravenously and it helps to harden the shells of the eggs. Nests and nesting. When the turkey hen is ready to lay, she will start in first by looking in all the corners. For if she is yarded up, it is in her nature to look for a dark and secluded spot in which to lay. I place to eight turkey hens four good dark nests. I make these by using packing cases with the cover on, and the opening turned towards the wall of the house, allowing just enough room for the bird to enter. I put good clean hay in the box. The turkey hen will be very happy when she finds that nobody can see her in her nest. It will make her very contented, and as we are now breeding turkeys in the domestic state, almost the same as the common hen, why not give them just the same care? You will find in the long run that you will raise many more turkeys if a turkey hen is properly housed and kept warm during the cold months of winter. The turkey hen begins to grow her eggs three months before she begins to lay. And as we all know that turkey is a very cold bird, it is only natural that she should be kept warm. My houses are comfortable, tight and dry, but well ventilated from the south side. When the turkey hen has laid about 18 or 19 eggs, she will show signs of wanting to sit. Very quietly take her off the nest, remove her to another coop, give her a good range to run in with plenty of Margaret Mahaney's turkey feed. In the meantime, set the eggs under two good common hens. I find that Plymouth rocks make good mothers. I put 11 or 12 eggs under a good Plymouth rock hen and make a good round nest in a half bushel box, stuffing the corners well so that the nest will stay in shape as a good nest is half the hatching. In the meantime, the turkey hen, having had her run, has forgotten all about sitting and has started to laying again, and I put her back in the mating pen. This process can be repeated three times during the season as a turkey hen will lay three litters in succession. I let my turkey hen sit on my June eggs and these hatch around the 11th or 12th of July. These make good hardy birds for the coming cold winter. Disinfect the hen with Margaret Mahaney's solve per directions before setting on the eggs. Hatching To go back to the hatching of the turkeys, the eggs that are right under the breast of the hen will hatch first. Sometimes I do not wait for them all to come out of the shell, taking them away, say four or five at a time, thus giving the outside eggs a chance to hatch. The eggs which I take away are put in an incubator which has previously been regulated to the right heat. When they are all hatched, I have my coop well whitewashed and about six inches of good clean straw on the bottom. I place my biddy in the coop and put the little turkeys all around her. Be very careful in giving them drink or water that the little turkeys do not get wet, for they often take cold in that way. First feed The first feed that I give them is common sting nettle, chopped fine, with a hard-boiled egg and a little shake of red pepper. 
you will find they will eat the green stuff ravenously, and this acts on the bowels as a regular physic. When they are three days old, I begin feeding them the prepared ground feed, Margaret Mahaney's turkey feed, with a little wheat-soaked bread and milk, squeezed dry and mixed with the egg and nettle. As the Park and Pollard Company carry this ground feed, it can be easily had there. I keep this always before them. In the morning, I give them nothing but the Margaret Mahaney turkey feed with a good feed of lettuce. At night, I give them the sting nettle again with bread soaked in milk and squeezed dry, and a little chopped onion, if convenient. You will find that the birds you feed the sting nettle to will throw the red three weeks before the ones that do not have it fed to them. Avoid vermin. When the little chicks first come out, before you put them in the coop, you must remember to disinfect with salve on the head and under the wings. Also give the foster mother the same treatment with the salve, for there are vermin on the hen that they will leave the hen and go to the little turkeys. And unless cared for, the little birds will sicken and die. If affected with lice, the bodies will become very red and irritated. You will find the lice especially under the wings or in the fringe of the wings. When the feathers do not grow evenly on a little turkey, some growing long while others are short, you will know that the turkey has lice and you should at once get busy. One or two doses of my salve will make a marked improvement. I always disinfect the hen when I put her on the eggs, but never disinfect her after the 15th day. For at that time there's life in the chick and you're very apt to kill it, as they breathe through the air cells of the egg. The setting of the turkey hen. In the wild state, the hen seeks the most secluded and inaccessible spot, where there is protection from birds and beasts of prey. Security against attack is the main thing instinct prompts her to look out for. A tangled thicket of briars, a sheltering ledge, a hollow stump, a clump of brush filled with the decaying leaves suits her fancy. With little preparation, she drops her eggs on the bare ground in these secluded places. Domestic turkeys are usually allowed a good deal of freedom in choosing their nests. I generally set them the same as I do the common hen. A half bushel basket is a comfortable nest for a turkey hen and will give plenty of room for 15 or 18 eggs. Turkeys require a good deal of attention while they are on the nests. They should be in one yard or building, or at least not far distant from one another that it may take as little time as possible to make the frequent visits necessary to each. Give the eggs room and have the nest deep enough to prevent their rolling out of the nest. A turkey hen will lay from 15 to 30 eggs at a litter, but she cannot always cover the whole lot. Very large old birds will cover 20 eggs. Smaller birds will cover from 15 to 18, which is about the proper number to allow one bird to take care of. If you have a dozen turkey hens in your flock, which is about the right number for a good range. It will not be difficult to set several birds at once, and this may be arranged by placing the nests containing artificial eggs within a few feet of each other. You can keep part of the hens on their nests for a few days until three or four are ready to sit. Then select eggs of as near equal age as possible and put them under the hens that are sitting persistently. If the hens close together are not set at the same time, there is danger when the first begins to hatch that her neighbor will hear the peep of the first chick and perhaps forsake her nest. If all the group of three or four nests are hatching at the same time, there is no trouble of this kind. Before putting the eggs in the nest, it is well to disinfect the hen with turkey salve under her wings. This will prevent vermin of any kind. If any of the eggs get fouled with the yolk of a broken egg before or after setting, the shells should be carefully cleaned with warm water to secure their hatching. Two or three turkeys will sometimes lay in the same nest. This will do no harm in the early part of the season, but they should be separated before setting, allowing only one bird to a nest. This may be done by making nests nearby and putting porcelain eggs into each new nest. Turkeys are not liable to crowd onto an occupied nest when there is a vacant one nearby. The group of hens that sit together and bring off the young at the same time will naturally feed and ramble together, and this will save time in looking after them. The turkey is a close sitter and will not leave her nest for several days at a time. Grain and water should be kept near the nest at all times. 
When the turkey begins to hatch, I take the little chicks out, just the same as I do when under a common hen, and give the ones that are not hatched a chance to do so. When they are all ready to go into the coop, I lift the hen very carefully and carry her to the coop, generally putting the little turkeys into the coops first, as the turkey hen is a very nervous bird and will scratch around and sometimes walk on the little birds. That is why I like having them good and strong before they go into the coop with the mother. The little fellows seem to understand that the mother should not step on them, for they will crowd over towards the side of the coop out of her reach. She will soon get used to them and to being fed and will settle down to taking care of her babies in good shape. As the turkey hen is a very devoted mother. She will watch out for those who feed her and take care of her little babies. They will run to meet me when they see me coming. That is, of course, if they are out in the field. I have had them come home themselves when I let them out for a ramble, and when I have gone to feed them, the mother would be in the coop with all the little babies. I give the same treatment to the turkey chicks that are brought up by their mother, as I do when they are brought up by a common hen. Only the common hen will leave them long before the turkey hen will think of forsaking her babies. I have gone into the turkey house when they were five or six months old, and would find a young turkey pullet nestling close to her mother. You do not find this in any other domestic bird that I know of. The Throwing of the Red and Young Turkeys As there seems to be some difference of opinion about the throwing of the red, first let me tell you what throwing of the red means. More or less blood must flow into the brain and head of the turkey when it shows so plainly through the skin. When a turkey is five weeks old or even four, it is time for it to begin to throw the red, as when blood comes from the liver and heart. Of course it must have some action on the little pullets. I have had young turkeys throw the red in five weeks and show it very plainly, that is after being fed twice a day on sting nettle. On the other hand, before I knew what to feed to them, I have had them linger along up until about seven or eight weeks and at the end of that time they would usually die. What had happened was that the blood had returned to the liver, becoming stagnant and caused diarrhea, which of course caused the death of the young turkey. When a young turkey is in good condition it ought to shoot the red from the beginning to the end in ten days. Of course it will not be as prominent as in a larger bird. As the bird grows the red becomes more apparent. When the little turkey is about four weeks old, the feathers will begin to fall from the head some. Then you will know that the critical time is at hand. The little bird begins to shoot the red. It mopes around sometimes for days. There will be nothing wrong with him except that he just does not feel well. Give plenty of sting nettle and a little tincture of iron three times a week, four drops of tincture of iron to a gallon of drinking water, and you will see an improvement in a couple of days. The young toms are much stronger than the pullets. Some of them will shoot the red and grow splendidly all through it with no signs of any drooping whatever, but there is always a marked change in the little pullets. After the red is grown, the secret of success in turkeys is to keep them growing. You can give them all the skim milk and all the sour milk they will drink. Feed them all the lettuce they can eat three times a day with nettle in the feed, if you have it on the place. It is one of the necessities in raising turkeys that you keep the liver clean, and if you feed lettuce two or three times a day, the droppings will be as bright green and in good condition. For my birds I have large runs, six feet each way, which makes a good square run. I move the runs every day to clean ground, the straw is taken out and aired. If it is damp weather, put clean straw in at least every other day. My coops are high and well ventilated at the top, which takes care of all the hot and impure air and keeps the little turkeys strong and healthy. I allow about 10 runs out at a time, consisting of 10 birds each, and let them go for a good long ramble. They do not stay away from the houses very long, however, but soon get tired and come back, usually staying out about 2 hours. Then I put them in their coops and let out about 10 more runs. When I put them back into the coops, I feed them lettuce and clean drinking water. I continue this process until I've let out the entire flock. 
I let out so many runs at a time that there will be no confusion in putting them in. I do this daily, every fair day, until the turkey is four or five months old. Then I let them all out together. I put them in larger houses every night, keep them good and warm, with good roosts and clean straw, and have very little trouble from disease. Every turkey should be allowed out for a while each day if the weather is fine and if there are no signs of rain. If it is lower or dark, do not let them out until the weather is pleasant again. This method of letting them out keeps them growing rapidly and makes them very tame so that they can be handled much more easily. Why not give a turkey the same care that we give a hen? People tell me many ways in which their turkeys are neglected. They seem to think that they do not need to look after turkeys and after they are hatched they will turn them out and let them wander and forage for themselves. The time of that kind of treatment for turkeys is past. Remember, we are raising turkeys now by the approved methods and full feeding applied to modern poultry raising. People will come to me and tell me that their turkey hens are roosting out in the net trees nights when it's below zero. As I've stated before, if it is in January, these turkey hens are beginning to grow eggs. What vitality is their back of eggs grown under conditions of that kind? None whatever. On hot days, you must cover the runs with burlap or shade of some description. I use the burlap sacks in which I receive dried bread waste that I buy. With reference to feeding bread, be sure never to feed bread that is mouldy, for if you do, you will start diarrhea in the young turkeys in no time. When fall is coming on, you must be very careful of the pullets. As I said before, they are much more subject to blackhead than are the toms. When I house them up, that is, in large houses, say 40 or 50 to one pen, I have my prepared feed for the turkeys. Margaret Mahaney's turkey feed, before the pullets all the time. The less corn you give any turkey hen, the less trouble you will have from blackhead, for corn is heating. To keep the pullets in good condition, you will find all the ingredients in this prepared feed, which is put up and sold now by the Park and Pollard Company. 46 Canal Street, Boston, under the name of Margaret Mahaney's turkey feed. Give more or less whole corn to Tom's if you want to get them in good condition for shipping or for dressing around Thanksgiving. They do not fatten up quite as quickly as the turkey hen, which is the reason I keep all corn and corn meal away from the turkey hens. Put one half teaspoonful of salicylates of soda in the drinking water in each pan at night. In the mornings, give them fresh water and twice a week, place in it a little tincture of iron. Four drops to each gallon of water. Do this up to about January, and then if the turkey hens are kept warm and comfortable, they are over the dangers of the blackhead season. Give the same treatment to the young toms. Thanks again for joining me on this episode of Sleepy Time Tales, a podcast designed around a bedtime story to help you to get a restful night. New episodes will be released every Sunday night to give you something fresh to help you rest in a new week. But make sure to subscribe in whatever service you use so that you get new episodes whenever they come out. A reminder that the music for tonight is Un Desert Bukumiku. Check out more of their work on their website and their Patreon, which you'll find linked in the show notes. Good night and sweet dreams. <laughs>